Thank you, Karen, for that <laughs> <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, and Jason, thank you for filming. Thank you to the brewery. Um, and this is really, really exciting. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out um, to hear science journalism being talked about. Um, and just, I want to say, um, I know people are coming from different spheres, but I know a lot of you are involved in different fights in communities that are dealing with things. And thank you for doing that. I can't stress this enough. I cannot do the work I do if there are not people um, collecting stories, collecting data, recording things, paying attention, and even recording, you know, on your on your psyche. I mean, physically taking the do, you know documenting what's happening, um, whether it's with a document or actually you know more personally. That um, I because I can't be everywhere, and so it's people in communities like Karen and leading me to other people that allows me to work, um, and it's just so important. Everything, every comment, every time you know you speak out to capture it. Um, that's you know, that's something that people like me can pick up on. So thank you. Um, and that's, um, that's actually sort of how I got started on this topic. So I just want to let you all are coming in like midstream. I'm still on this project. So it's, it's unusual to give a presentation about something you're still digging into. The magazine story hasn't even come out yet. Um, I haven't told my editors I'm doing this. I think it's, you know, a smart idea to prepare people but I mean, there's a couple reasons. One is this topic is so complicated that I really feel like I have to arm people with the knowledge on how to appreciate the article um, and understand it when it does come out. And <coughs> two is, um, yeah, that's really the main reason. And I and I like um, I like talking about it. I also learn things. So I'll. Just quickly give a background. Karen gave a good introduction. How I first got into this, I covered a lot of different environmental science issues um, and would write a lot about you know, space or bees, fun stories about ecology. And then it got um, a little bit darker as I found my way into environmental problems and some of the environmental issues we're facing today and eventually onto unconventional oil and gas development. And so I did a tour. I really, again, I wanted to learn from the people in the field. So I did a tour through the Marcellus and the Utica, these two really uh, big shale plays, big areas of unconventional oil and gas development fracking in the Northeast. Um, and I called this hitchhiking and energy rush. I just, I let people on the ground tour me around and it was like a chain. I went from one area, I started all the way down in Virginia where you have people in trees protesting pipelines and I camped with them. And then I was connected to other activists and organizers and community members further around, um, ending up in Pennsylvania, and then on through Ohio, where you have a lot of family farms and massive infrastructure popping up in the middle of the night uh, next to family farms. I mean, literally, like overnight, um, people you know who had been on land, and you know, you all know this type of story. Um, so, and it was so important to you know see it through people's eyes, smell it, hear it through you know their land. Um, and it was on that trip, the last day, someone mentioned. Um, do you know about this radioactive product that's been sold at Lowe's? Um, and I, I didn't know that. And so this product, and this is, and that started me. That was May 2018. So I've now, I sent a little pitch. I was like, hey, to my editor at Rolling Stone, um, I've got this interesting new thing with fracking. Like maybe we'll do a quick web story on this. They're selling a radioactive product at Lowe's. Um, and that, yeah, that was a year and a half ago. It's not a quick little story. I'm still going. There'll be a, a magazine article coming out in Rolling Stone in December that will give a pretty strong um, primer on the topic. And then I'm also working on a book on this issue. Um, and just so just because we're there with um, for the moment, I'm going to lay out. So that product, it's called Aqua Selena. So this is in the Northeast. It's been really common to use brine or produced water that comes up at uh, an oil gas well as a de-icer on roads or to keep dust down on roads. And um, in this one instance, a company w decided to take that one step further and actually start marketing it. So usually it will go straight to like a town, to a community, to their highway roads department. 
um, selling it at stores, and they were selling it at Lowe's. And this is just like a quick intro into the science of um, radioactivity. So radium is one, uh, it's a radioactive element, and it's what we talk about a lot when we're looking at the different streams of oil and gas waste. And it's, you know, the EPA is so concerned about it, that one doesn't work, um, that they have set a safe drinking water limit at five picocuries per liter. The units get very difficult. Um, Curie, you probably can figure out where that's coming from, Marie Curie, but just know that five. It's really bad, and we don't want more than five. And even a toxic landfill, like a Superfund site, the limit in the topsoil, you don't want radium above, you can't have radium above five picocuries per gram. So again, pretty low. Um, and this product being sold at Lowe's, Ohio Department of Natural Resources state agency tested it, um, and they found it at 2,500 <laughs> picocuries per liter. Exactly. So that was like, what's happening here? And that um, then we start down the rabbit hole. So I think it's appropriate to start. Um, Wendell's a scientist. I know there's other scientists here. The scientists have known about this, and this is what's amazing. So this, and, and along the way, just to explain, it, it really is like a rabbit hole. Like I would find a paper, I would connect with someone, they say, oh, have you seen this paper? And I would look at it, it would blow my mind, I would stay up all night reading it, and then I would look at the citations that seemed appropriate and go to them, and it just was like piecing it together. This was a really important one. Distri distribution of radioactivity in ancient sediments. So what this paper is talking about is that at the bottom of um, the, a shallow sea where you're forming, where you have a lot of sediments accumulating um, off the land. So just imagine like the Gulf of Mexico, you know, you have a lot of rivers coming in and you're accumulating sediments there. Um, you are going to make what's called um, right there in point 12, a black shale. A black shale is this layer, this sedimentary layer that has a lot of organic gunk in it. Um, and that is your future oil and gas bearing layer, a black shale. So what this paper is saying is inherent to black shales, you will have radioactivity. You have two very long-lived radioactive elements, uranium-238 and thorium-232. They're accumulating naturally in the same place where your future oil and gas bearing layer um, is coming from. And, and this was a really big realization of understanding it. It's, it's essentially radioactivity, is, it's cooked in from the beginning in many cases. Not all black shales have such a high signature, um, but some have very, very high. And black shales are kind of like your mother load for um, oil and gas. That's, that's the parent. So I just, this is a hard um, topic to draw, but I'm going to try to do it because, again, um, I think it helps to see it. So let's see if this one works better. That should be good. Okay, so right, shallow sea marine environment. Um, you know what? Let's use this paint. Um, uh, nice. Okay. Here's our waves. Okay. Here's the land mountains, <coughs> rivers flowing in, and there's a lot of marine algae also in this area. It's a productive area, a shallow sea, and things are falling to the bottom and accumulating. Um, the rivers are bringing in uranium-238, thorium-232. So these are, um, and, they're, and they're eroding from the rocks of land. This is naturally in the Earth's crust, and um, some mountainous areas will have more uranium-238 more thorium-232 than others, which can, down the line, mean some oil and gas layers are more radioactive. And what, um, I, uh, something that almost takes us to a spiritual level, these, these radionuclides, uranium-238, thorium-232, they're known as, as primal radionuclides. They're, they're around from the beginning, the formation of um, the solar system, essentially. They're still there. And um, I'm going to speed through a really complicated topic with, you know, what I've learned from others. But, you know, we, there used to be many, many more radioactive elements, but they slowly decay over time to stable elements. Uranium-238 
it hasn't had time to decay yet. The universe is so young, it's like this leftover gift from the beginning of time. Um, so you form your black shale here, and it's going to be peppered with some amount of uranium-238, thorium-232. And then if you fast forward over time, um, there's your black shale. It gets buried. So now if you're in an oil and gas producing region, some of it might have leaked out, uh, seeped up, flowed out, and it will get stuck behind an impervious rock in what I think in geology is called the trap. And if you put a well into there, that's a conventional well. It's under pressure. Um, it will come up much more easily. Um, and that's what we've been doing for a long time. Unconventional, go back to your block shale, it's still squeezed in there. It formed in that layer. That's its mother layer. It's a lot harder to get it out. So you have to go down and frack, do the process of fracking, crack it out to get it out. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out down the line to explain the, the reinforce this idea that one, it's cooked in from the beginning. So I'm going to go to this next slide, which really helps understand that. So the USGS and the Atomic Energy Commission back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they knew this, and they put out this amazing paper, Oil Yield and Uranium Content of Black Shales, 1960. This paper is put out, and you can see, we're done on behalf of the Atomic Energy Commission. Why do they care about black shale? They, so this paper is looking at black shales as a potential for mining, A, oil, and which we now know we're doing, um, and they talk about the difficulties, and B, uranium. There's so much uranium in black shales that they're considering it as a possible reservoir for mining. Um, and this is just a quote from this paper. I've been, I want to run this by a present-day scientist to see, you know, were these numbers accurate? But it's a professional government report. The amount of uranium in these shales is extremely large, reckoned in billions of tons of metallic uranium. Um, so, again, if you fast forward to the present, to a layer like the Marcellus, where we know it has a high radioactive signature, it, it starts to seem completely deranged that we're going to... Um, frack into this radioactive layer. Um, and so then we go to, um, OK, and this is, and this becomes really instrumental, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Um, and I gave these folks credit because they did an awesome job. In 2014, two Colorado journalists, Jefferson Dodge, Joel Dyer, wrote about this in Boulder Weekly, about this loophole. Um, and I know we hear a lot about the Halliburton loophole, certainly many loopholes, exemptions, they're all important. But this is really um, the, uh, the, god, the godmother of the loopholes. It, so the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act essentially says, we're, as a country, we're going to produce a lot of waste. Um, and we know that some is going to have a hazardous signature. Um, but we want to deal with it appropriately. We, we, we can't help producing hazardous waste, but at least we're going to track it from cradle to grave. We're going to make sure it goes in an appropriately marked truck driven by a professionally trained driver who knows what's in their truck. We're going to put it in a landfill that is, you know, sighted away from human beings and meant to contain hazardous waste. Um, and then there's this other waste that it's not hazardous and it has a lot less regulations. Well, guess what group of waste got an exemption? So oil and gas waste, we just, um, and I'm going to explain what oil and gas waste is, but it is very toxic. It has um, a lot of heavy metals, and it has potentially huge amounts of radioactivity. Um, and in 1980, so it gets this exemption. It's not hazardous, even though technically it is hazardous. And this just tells it all. So in 1988, the EPA was forced by a couple different environmental groups to review the exemption um, and see, you know, do they get to keep their exemption? or do we have to actually call oil and gas waste hazardous? So they say, EPA's review of the third factor found da 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 da. It could subject billions of barrels of waste to regulation, whereas if we just um, keep it not hazardous, or no, sorry, okay, billions of barrels of waste causes severe economic impact on the industry and on oil and gas production in the US. Um, so that right there is amazing. They're saying we, because it could potentially harm the industry economically, we need to call something that's clearly, you know, scientifically hazardous, not hazardous. And then they go on. Um, essentially, there's so much waste that it's going to strain the ability to store it. Um, and there's, um, and I think they talk about there's not even enough regulators to um, 
to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And then this line is interesting. Um, would create, so permitting delays would hinder new facilities, disrupting the search for new oil and gas deposits. So to, uh, they're essentially saying um, the industry couldn't exist as we know it without this exemption. And this was another, so many aha moments. This, uh, and this is what Joel's article is about. This was, um, this is a major revelation. Um, I mean, and if you, and so why does that matter? What, like, what does it mean hazardous versus not hazardous? How does that end up mattering on the ground? So I'm going to draw, um, I think I can do it with our um, same diagram. But let me just do one more slide, actually. So does the industry know about this? So this is a 1982 paper of the American Petroleum Institute's Department of Medicine and Biology. I got this from a former state regulator. Um, it has never been publicly released. And it's going to be featured in my article. And once I put it out, I'm going to give it to as many people as I can because it's extraordinarily important. So this is the industry. The, I didn't even know the API had a Department of Medicine and Biology, but they do. Um, and like, this is incredible. Almost all materials of use to the petroleum industry contain measurement, OK, of radionuclides. API should be more concerned. And then they go through some of these specific elements. Potent source. Radon is a direct daughter of radium. Um, we'll go through that. Um, so they're laying it out. The reason this paper exists is because in the late 70s, early 80s, the, you know, the young EPA, energetic uh, maybe at that time, you know, wanted to start um, you know, uh, setting off the um, creating limits on hazardous things. And they wanted to regulate radon, which is a radioactive gas. And so in doing that, the industry thought, oh, if they regulate radon, this could be bad. Let's do a paper and see what happens if radon is regulated. And so because of that analysis, I have this paper. We all have this paper. They you know, went through and they realized, oh, wow, radon causes a lot of problem in the industry. And their conclusion on down the line is like it's going to be devastating if they regulate radon um, under the Clean Air Act. Um, so it was never regulated under the Clean Air Act. Radon is not regulated. Um, and then just to, again, the industry's own analysis. I couldn't, um, there's now, a, this paper's behind a paywall, but this is another pretty um, powerful paper. Peter Gray, an industry consultant, writing in the Oil and Gas Journal in 1990. And again, we just go down to the highlighted in varying degrees of severity. Norm is what the industry likes to call oil and gas radioactivity. It stands for naturally occurring radioactive materials. It's a nice word, you know, it um, makes you not think of it. Um, again, may consist at all production sites and related facilities. And so now we're going to go down another rabbit hole, including pipe handling yards, metal reclamation areas, natural gas and NGL pipelines, gasoline plants, and NGL refineries and terminals. So the whole spectrum of, yeah, the whole arc of um, the industry's apparatus, uh, you know, from the wellhead, midstream, downstream, it's still there. Um, and then they talk about um, yeah, potential public relations problem. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be. I mean, when people, and, and, and the question that, like, you know, my editors keep asking me is, like, well, how, how come no one, rid of, how come it's not out? How come no one's done this? Um, it's, I don't know, it's hard. To, there's, yeah, I think you need, it's more sociology, maybe, as to that, that answer than, um, you know, I, I can answer that. I don't know. It's, it's crazy. But um, OK, so I'm going to have to go. OK, so I'm going to leave that up. So OK, so where, like, wh what is oil and gas waste? What are these wastes that got this very special exemption? So um, essentially, the, the two main wastes are um, brine, or the industry will call this produced water, um, and then drill cuttings our second, and then, um, and then third, this isn't a waste, but this is, um, so let's make this, these are pathways of, pathways radioactivity um, is brought to the surface with oil and gas development. So one produced water brine, two drill cuttings, Three in the product itself, um, and four is um, something called scale, 
which is a hardened precipitate that forms on the inside of pumps and valves. Um, so um, it gets quite complicated, but I'm going to focus on brine or produced water because I think that's something a lot of people kind of have seen. If you live in an area like you all do where there's development, maybe you've seen a brine truck, a produced water truck. They go around um, in areas, uh, you know, there's, if you look at a wellhead, there's a tank for um, oil or um, NGLs, whatever sort of product is coming up. And then there's also a tank that says brine. Um, so brine or produced water, uh, in most uh, plays, there's more brine produced water coming up than oil and gas. I mean, the people who explain the science to me will say, really, oil and gas is the byproduct. <laughs> And we're drilling for brine or produced water. Um, and in some areas, there can be like 10 barrels of brine for every you know, barrel of oil. There's a lot of brine um, that comes up. Uh, in the early days, that was just like Louisiana, early 1900s. It was just kind of sloughed off into um, canals or into the bayous. Um, then they started making pits. And pits became a common way to just put not just brine, but a lot of other oil and gas waste, drill cuttings as well, for example. Um, and what's very common now is injection wells. Yes, please ask a question. Okay, what about the VOCs? Is it in the VOCs? So no, um, so, so right, where does it stick? Like where is the radioactivity? So um, it's in essentially, most of it is in the produced water. And the reason it's in the produced water, so if we're going back to the beginning, we have uranium and thorium in the oil and gas producing layer and a direct daughter product <laughs> of, um, sorry, not a direct daughter product, um, a daughter product of both of those decay chains is, is radium. Um, and radium, uh, whereas uh, many things higher up in that chain are not so soluble, radium can be quite soluble. Um, it can flow with water. So, uh, and, and different geochemical conditions can enable radium to, um, to join the produced water stream. And this is something uh, that really the science is still being cracked um, into, like exactly why does radium join the produced water stream versus stay in the rock? Maybe it's going to stay there in the rock. Um, in the Marcellus, it's, r it's really rich in radium. And a lot of, um, there's a lot of research to indicate that, that various salts like chloride um, concentration can, um, in a way that's too complicated for me to explain, but can help free up the radium. And so you can have high radium. But so, yeah, it's going to be um, in that mix. So if you s so and this is why the exemption becomes important. So that um, here's the wellhead that we have. There's maybe a brine tank um, and just say a truck comes and and fills up with brine. This truck, at least back east, um, has it will maybe just say brine. Sometimes they just say water, sometimes they say waste. There's no placarding, there's no labeling to indicate that the truck is carrying something hazardous because by law, it's not carrying something hazardous. It's carrying something non-hazardous, so it doesn't need. Um, and even when I talk to PHMSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, um, and I say, how many brine trucks do we have across the country or in the Marcellus or in the Denver Drillsburg, they don't track it because it's not hazardous. They only track hazardous materials. And they've actually told me we can't go outside the scope of our agency and track something that's not hazardous. You know, we'd be tracking Fritos. Um, so <laughs> they don't track it. So it's a complete black hole. And you can see how worrisome this is. So in Ohio and Pennsylvania, where you have these major plays, um, this is a job you'll see advertised on the side of the road. Brine hauler, bottle truck driver is how it's often referred to. There's a lot of unemployment in that area. It's been economically taken a lot of punches for many reasons. Um, and so people take this job. And a lot of people that I've spoken to are quite dubious, um, but they need a job. And this job you know, can pay well for this region. They're not given any training on radioactivity. They're not um, told, they're t often told they're literally hauling water. I mean, it's really criminal what's happening. But so like, where would they actually get their exposure? So one job, if you're a brine truck driver, the truck is smaller than the tank, but you know, here's um, your brine tank. They have to go um, inside and clean out the inside of that tank. 
And so I'll tell you how a driver who drove in Pennsylvania described this job is done to me. Um, no mask or respirator, just normal PPE, which is, you know, like uh, flame resistant top and bottom, um, and a rope wrapped around their waist so in case they pass out or die they can be dragged out <laughs> by a colleague and they're cleaning with a squeegee getting like the sludge that builds up on the side of the brine tank or in the bottom and putting it towards the you know the exit point from the brine tank so a special truck called the super sucker um, that has a lot of sucking power can pull that out um, so and then even in hooking their truck up to the brine tank there can be um, Drivers have told me, you know, Brian will slosh on me. It will spill over me. Okay, well, guess what? Then they're on the road to an injection well. Back east, it could be like 100 miles, 150 miles. They, because um, Pennsylvania doesn't have a lot, um, but Ohio has tons. So a big route is to go from Pennsylvania or West Virginia to Ohio. You're on public highways. There's certain rest areas, there's certain restaurants where drivers stop at, and, um, you know, they're uh, using the public restroom, opening doors, all of this stuff. Um, and then it gets even worse. Many instances of drivers, um, this is another practice that's been described to me by a driver. You know, we'll all go to the same restaurant and we back our trucks into the restaurant and um, we don't want to go all the way to the injection well. So we just open the back of our truck and eat lunch and we come back and it's empty. And then we can go get a new load without having to drive all the way to the injection well. Um, just complete regulatory dissolution. Um, and, and they're not, and, and the trucks crash. Um, in one case I report about a truck crashed right next to a reservoir, the main drinking supply for this town in Ohio called Barnesville. Radium showed up in the reservoir. Um, and if you remember our numbers, so five is the EPA limit. Um, that product being sold at Lowe's, Lowe's still hasn't answered my questions, um, 2,500. Um, Marcellus brine can be as high as 28,500 pico carries per liter. Those are the highest numbers I've seen. That's really, really high. And some of the best sources have been people who used to work in the nuclear industry. And they'll tell me things like, if I had a beaker of that on my desk and I spilled it, you know, they would shut down my whole section of, um, of the facility. And if I accidentally took something like that home, I could go to jail. And yet, you know, these drivers... Um, are hauling it across community streets regularly. Yeah. How do you, you get that measurement? So yeah, so no, no, great, great question. So again, there is data. Pennsylvania put out, this measurement came from something called the Pennsylvania T-Norm Report. Um, and it, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, you know, a lot of people were raising radioactivity issues. So they put out this report in um, 2016 that went through a lot of what I'm going through here, a lot of these different um, portals, ways radioactivity uh, comes to the surface as a concern. And there's this kind of style that these reports are done. Like some of the data can be really damning, but the conclusion is going to be like, but it's all okay and we're going to keep going forward. But if you actually dig in to the data, you find things like this and you're like, oh my goodness, that's, that's a high number. And there's other, you know, there's other very interesting data in that report, even though the takeaway you know, is essentially um, business as usual. Um, and they actually do, that report does express concern about workers and the group that they say would be most at risk are these brine haulers, these drivers. Um, so, um, but there is a second group. So, and, and again, I wanna reiterate this, this is so important because I've, I've seen from here, you know, how the industry will use um, workers. I'm well aware, you know, you need to work um, and the importance of a job and, and the interest of jobs in this industry. Um, uh, but they um, are the front lines of this. They are absolutely the front lines. And, and I'm going to get to where communities are at risk. But so these drivers, second group would be something, um, we call them frack waste cleaning plants. Um, so this is, you know, a lot of people now are aware of injection wells. They know about the earthquake risks. They don't like the trucks, the brine trucks going through their neighborhood. So the industry has reacted to that and started doing something called treatment or cleaning. And this is truly frightening. And the industry is very proud of this because they can bill it as something uh, environmentally friendly. They can um, reuse the brine water to frack a new well. Um, so, you know, we don't have to take from the local stream or the local reservoir anymore. We're, we're reusing our water. Um, and that, that's really great. Well, no, 
that's a disaster because what they're doing is they're basically setting up like a high school science experiment. They're putting these big vats and they're letting the brine settle out. And so you're, this is often done, and when I was with Karen, we were looking for these. This is often done in like what looks like an airport, um, an airplane hangar type structure. And because there's so much radon, which is a radioactive gas venting out, you have to do this in an open space. Um, and um, so, th but, but still, you, you have these big pools. You're letting the solids in the brine settle out. And a lot of the radioactivity, it seems, you know, radium tends to bond to clays and things like that. So you would appropriately settle out, but definitely not everything. Um, but um, the people working there, again, no mass, no respirator, no knowledge about what they're dealing with. I've talked to them. You know, they're very proud that they've learned this all themselves, that they've never taken a science class. Um, and, and it's so, it's just such a disconnect because they, they, the industry is so exciting to them. They, you know, and they, a lot of them are very interesting life stories. You know, they've made a very difficult life situation work and started their own companies sometimes that are frack waste cleaning companies, but they know nothing about what's actually in the materials that they're dealing with. And a lot of the potential illnesses down the line, you know, don't show up immediately. So right now they could, you know, people are smiling. Um, but when I talk to the health experts who are in my story, um, and I run this, you know, I find something out from spending time with workers and then I run it by the health experts. And I mean, though this led some of them to almost break down in tears and they said, they're, they're all going to die. Um, no, th this is devastating. Um, and, um, it's, um, so we, well, we can lead from that into the second topic. Cause so even if you do that, even if you can successfully take brine that has a very high, radium count and remove all the radium. Um, and you can get water, it's not potable water, but you can use it you know, to frack a new well or maybe some other industrial purpose. Okay, that's good. But what about the sludge? It's now, if you've removed, you've inherently concentrated. So what do you do with that now? Now the sludge at the bottom of the tanks that they use is gonna be really hot. Um, and so where that often goes um, is to a community landfill. And again, because of the exemption, it's not hazardous waste. So if you had a waste that was truly hazardous, you could never put it in your local municipal dump. But um, this isn't, it's, this is non-hazardous. So um, now there are, and, and things get tricky when you start manipulating a waste. Um, some states, the industry refers to that as T-norm, and there are some uh, restrictions on that. But essentially, it's very easy to um, to, you know, kind of like you've moved it along the chain. So it will go to a community landfill. Even if there's a, ra uh, a radiation detector, a counter at the landfill, some have them. It's a very complicated um, procedure to, you know, take a 5,000 5, gallon truck that looks like a septic truck or looks like a dump truck and take a reading. And you can imagine if no regulators are watching, and they probably aren't, it's pretty easy to you know, not do that really intricate job accurately. And then again, reports of waste coming in at night when the counter is down, um, waste being snuck in. This is, these are things that community members tell me and then eventually you know, a whistleblower will come out and confirm this sort of practice is happening. Um, but even without that, you know, Pennsylvania has good records. So there's landfills in Pennsylvania that have received, they get like 100,000 tons of drill cuttings a year um, and then they get a lot of these sludges, and, and that's, you know, really worrisome. Yeah. You talked about the produced water being clean. Yeah. Is um, any of it considered clean enough to go into the agricultural cycle? Yeah. So, um, I, so this is, <laughs> so why I think it's so important to give talks like this is because where the industry is at right now is they recognize that there is resistance to um, the old ways of dealing with produced water, such as an injection well. So they're now, they see this as an opportunity and, and there's this new term in the industry, beneficial use. That's an old term, but the oil and gas industry is now looking at produced water with a mind to beneficial use. And that's where these Ohio folks, you know, came in. They were early, you know, they were um, early entrepreneurs in this game. They were really pioneers, but this is something, I went to an EPA conference last year on beneficial use. And it was extraordinary. The head of um, one of their water divisions, um, who you know is a recent appointee, 
you know, laid out this rambling speech about how we got to deal with this produced water problem, we're going to make it into usable products. So there are, there's companies, um, and I covered the BP oil spill, and what was interesting about that is you had all these inventors come with their own idea of how to, you know, stop the well, which was cool, like people trying entrepreneurship, throw their idea out. It's the same thing happening right now with produced water. There's people, um, interesting people, not training with this, but they have some like wild idea about they're going to build a plant that's going to treat this water and make it usable for agriculture. So this has already been done in some states. In Wyoming, um, New Mexico, I believe is like in the thick of it. I don't know with every state what's happening, but that is um, what a lot of people want to do right now. And they're trying to maneuver state by state because there are no federal laws on this. They're trying to maneuver the laws to make it easier to do things like use it for agriculture. That's like a big buzzword. We're going to use it for agriculture. And I'll address like why it's so hard. But yeah, another question. Well, and I just talked to truckers in green and they yeah. told me that when they go to the dispose of it, yeah. if it's too dirty, they're told you can't reuse it. Right. Another well. And then they'll give them the addresses of farms. And I guess yeah. the farmers like it for the debt market. Okay, right. And so and this yeah, is right. Spray it on the yeah, so this is what so you're right. And 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 so now we're gonna this is another rabbit hole. Yeah, no, and so this is something else. Land farming is a practice of dealing um, with a, with drill cuttings typically, which are a solid component of the waste. And um, and I'll go in so why are drill cuttings so radioactive? So we just define this black shale as, you know, kind of impregnated with uranium and thorium. And so a typical, um, hor a typical vertical well, your drill cuttings, you're going through various sedimentary layers. They're not necessarily going to be that toxic. But once you get to the black shale, um, there's a wonderful paper from 2010. It describes it as a garbage rock because it's loaded with so many toxic heavy metals and so much radioactivity. So once you go through the black shale, you're sending a lateral now. They're making laterals like that are two miles long. So um, that's a lot of drill cuttings. You're t and then another lateral. And there could be like 10 laterals at a well. All those drill cuttings have to come back up, and they're going to go um, in various, you know, off into a landfill. But yes, some states have legitimized this practice of land spreading, of spreading it on fields. Because field. they have some beneficial chemicals. Right, and I've and I've and I begin I've begun to crack into this, and I'm going to go visit Oklahoma. Apparently, like the really Oklahoma parts of Kansas and Texas. But I did see the site um, in this area where this is happening. But again, this, I mean, in Oklahoma, there are businesses that take the drill cuttings and, um, and then, you know, they're middle people and they deal with the farmers. And okay, in a, with a, again, with a vertical well, maybe it's fine, but there wasn't a digestion of um, these old papers that I started with when we got into fracking to say, well, maybe these drill cuttings are going to be different. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, it, agriculture and the industry have been connected before. And just to go back to this, like, this room of inventors, imagine the EPA, this like raucous Wild West room of inventors and everyone throwing out their idea about how they want to clean, produce water. Okay, so this is, um, the story comes up again and again. People, you know, money's poured in, they build a, we have a new idea, we're going to use what we use at this um, land, you know, like uh, technology from the sewage industry or technology from the beverage industry. There's a Japanese beverage company who wants to get into this. Um, good luck. But what happens is, um, so I'll give you a core example. A company called Entero, based here, um, downtown Denver, and a company called Veolia, fancy French uh, water and waste management management company teamed up to build a massive plant, a $300 million plant to essentially, it's a big frack waste cleaning plant. It's in northern West Virginia. And they, the industry, threw all sorts of accolades at this plant. It's, you know, the pearl of the industry. We were solving the produced water problem. Eventually, we can, you know, use it for all these other beneficial uses. Um, and the drivers I talked to were completely frightened by this plant. And this plant just shut down about a month ago. The industry will say, has said, that it's because commodity prices are, are, you know, moving up and down and it's not profitable anymore. What I hear from the drivers is that the plant, you know, has had issues with um, processing this very complex material. I don't know that for certain, and I'm in the process of trying to figure out exactly why the plant was shut down. But I have a lot of other deta details on that plant um, that will be in the Rolling Stone story. The main... Uh, takeaway is that it's hard to do this. It's, you know, don't listen to these companies. Even if they have good scientists at solid universities behind this, 
Um, it's like this exciting technical challenge, but what that means on the ground is that people uh, in, who are not prepared to be dealing with this waste are going to be dealing with it. So when I hear frack waste cleaning, I, I think dead and sick workers, and it's, um, it's not something good. Um, was there another question while we were on that germ? Um, so this, this can translate, um, jump back to your area. So, okay, the drill cuttings in the Marcellus, um, we, I've seen, again, this Pennsylvania report has some numbers. They have um, uranium that's at like five to 10 times above background, but they didn't, I haven't seen that much data from the drill cuttings. Um, and with the produced water, we have a lot of different data points by now in at least some place. With the drill cuttings, um, we don't. So it's very difficult. I can say if this landfill is taking 120,000 tons of Marcellus drill cuttings, we're going to be really worried that you're piling up a lot of radioactive waste right next to a community. But the numbers from the drill cuttings aren't in. And when I've looked around for the denver Julesburg numbers, it's like complete ghost ship. There's, I haven't seen any radioactivity numbers. Maybe some people have, and I would love to be led to them. But this becomes this game of like searching for it. But we recently found out um, th you know, the concern over the drill cutting pathway. And that happened because in Pennsylvania, you have this landfill um, in a community called Bell Vernon. And I'm just writing this down because the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, some phenomenal reporters there have been really hot on this issue. Um, and, and they've written about this. And what happened is there was a sewage treatment plant that was taking the leachate from the landfill. So the leachate is, is you know, this stew that comes off the landfill because of rain or because of naturally um, liquidy stuff in the landfill. And it comes down and the sewage treatment plant was processing it and then sending it out into the Monongahela River, which goes through downtown Pittsburgh. And so the landfill, the sewage treatment manager, they're the one who pulled the alarm on this because suddenly their bugs, their sewage, you know, uh, bacteria they used for sewage, they weren't working. Things were getting dunked up. And if the bugs aren't working, that means they're sending, you know, partially treated raw sewage into this river that is drinking water for all these communities downstream. You know, the river is finally coming back after the steel days. People swim, boat, um, fish. And, and, and then he, you know, the, the, treat, um, the treatment plant manager became hip to the radioactivity. And he's like, well, then we have no ability to clean out radium. We're just streaming that stuff in. So um, a lot of complicated legal things happen. But one thing that happened that I can convey to you is they were smart enough to test their leachate stream. And we just got results back. And it was um, like 370 pico carries per liter. So this is the leachate that's coming off the landfill. So it's been through like, you know, there's a lot of different places for the radium to settle out, but 370 coming off this landfill, I, this was a big moment for the people who are, you know, hip to this issue. Wow, there is something in the drill cuttings and in what's going into that landfill because it's enough to generate, you know, a radioactive leachate stream that for years now has just been going right into the Monongahela. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, yeah, this, this issue too, still going through, still, um, you know, lawsuits involved. The, um, the, land, the landfill has been directed to not send its leachate to this treatment plant anymore. So they kind of won, but now we'll guess where it's going. It's just going to go, it's going to other treatment plants just down the road in Ohio or Pennsylvania. And, um, and this is, um, pardon my French here, but this sewage treatment operator, Again, if it weren't for people blowing the whistle, collecting data, I'd have nothing. Um, he's like, he laid it out. He said, we're the asshole of the fracking industry. And it's just such a perfect analogy because, right, again, even if you clean it at a frack waste, you know, cleaning treatment plant, you accumulate it at the bottom, that then goes to your local landfill. It's like, it's where it all ends up. That's the home. So the leachate is a worry. And where my reporting has led me now, I'm more concerned about the communities downwind of these landfills because they're, um, they're, they're in constant use, these landfills. There's so much drilling going on, so much drill cuttings going in. There's not time to like cap the whole landfill and go, you know, they're, they're active. There's dust coming up. You have sun baking on it. And this is really frightening. This landfill, the one outside Bell Vernon, it started, you know, it's a very hilly, not mountains like you all have here, but hilly Appalachia region. And the landfill started as this little garbage dump in the 50s. The people who've been there a while remember. The landfill is now the highest um, feature in this area. You can see it even from I-70. 
Um, if you just keep driving east through the night, you'll get there eventually. Um, and it's um, and so people who live just on wind, you know, are worried. They worry about dust, seeing this metallic dust accumulating in their yard, um, getting sick when they mow the lawn. And so these are, you know, suddenly you're into um, like radiation biology or, or environmental toxicology. You know, and I hear things from people in communities. Um, okay, wow, does this make sense? These people are getting sick when they mow the yard. And then I run it by um, environmental toxicology contest. One of the best is a woman in Louisiana named Wilma Subra, um, who won a MacArthur Genius Grant, and she's done work endlessly fighting for communities. But I ran this by her. Is, does this make sense, mowing the yard? And she said, oh, yeah, we saw that after Katrina. Um, toxic, especially heavy metals, you know, can settle out in the soil and... Af um, after you know a toxic wave comes in or coming off a landfill little uh, radioactive aerosols they can fall down with rain or fall down on their own and then when you mow the yard it stirs things up um, so this is something when i'm in areas you know and uh, there's a certain list of questions that starts to build and one of them is like well do people get sick mowing the yard around here i still haven't seen reference to this in a medical journal um, but there are at least two experts who've said, oh yeah, this makes sense as a pathway. We are really worried about people downwind of these landfills. Um, and um, yeah, and so I guess I'm going to go through a little bit of the radioactivity ab ab about the decay chain science because, okay. yeah. Do you know uh, of any around us? I mean, are we yeah. living in the middle so, of the, all this stuff, or, what, or is it so, somewhere else? No, there are, because uh, Karen probably knows um, the answer. There is a landfill in Weld County operated by Waste Management, right? And they are receiving waste from North Dakota? Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is worrisome. So there's some layers I know a lot about. The Marcellus, you know, these, that paper from 1960 looked at the Marcellus. There's good data. We know it's pretty hot. Um, the Bakken, there's now been some research. The Bakken, the numbers are high, but not necessarily as high as the Marcellus. So if you have Bakken waste coming in like that landfill does, yeah, I'm really worried about a landfill like that. But are the Denver, Julesburg drill cuttings themselves, do they have a high uranium count, radium count? I don't know. And that's a question that I think people who like to FOIA state regulators um, I would, you know, ask, do you have, have you taken samples of drill cuttings coming from the DJ and have you tested for uh, radium-226, radium-228, or uranium-238? What are the numbers? If you haven't tested, why haven't you tested? Um, yeah. It's also that exact same uh, landfill is used for a dumping site, for example, when we have the huge explosion in Windsor. Uh, the, the top six inches of the soil had to be removed from a large portion of that pad. And I have every manifest sheet that right. was used, and it went right to that landfill and was okay, dumped. Right. Absolutely. So where is it? Uh, from 14. Oh, oh really? Mm -hmm. on 14. And there's an office landfill that they yeah. call stuff. Yeah. Is it the same yeah. landfill? I don't think oh, well, the old yeah. landfill is taking anything from Wyoming or, or the back. But there is a landfill further south. Okay, with the U.S. Ecology one? Is uh, that the one? I was trying to think of the name. I used to know the name of yeah. it. Yeah. But I can't. I know. I, yeah, I think, I think it's the U.S. Ecology landfill. So there's a couple of different big players. One is U.S. Ecology. The other is Waste Management. They change their names. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. Well, these big, so what's interesting yeah. in this industry, the landfill is the the gobbling oh, each other yeah. up. Yeah, clean harbors. I think it's clean harbors. Clean harbors. Clean harbors. Okay. So, I know. so, yeah. So yeah. then it's like back to people, like you all figuring this sort of thing out. Where are the landfills? Oh, wasn't there some the talk ways? of... of of uh, mining for uranium, yeah, I mean, north of us, then they did that. They're gone. Okay. And then they decided right. they weren't going to do that. So yeah, there's uranium there. Yeah. Right. And I don't know enough because uh, from what I under I think that this would be a different, um, you know, it, it, you're dealing with different layers of the earth. But I still want to have a conversation with a geologist who knows this area who can either tell me yay or nay why we don't or do have to worry about the radioactive signature of the dendro Julesburg. I will say, though, that the produced water, if you use chloride, this salt, as an indicator, the chloride is very low 
in the DJ, which according to you know, a big body of research, that, that would imply that radium counts would be low too, because they usually track each other. But, um, but then I talk to scientists who say, oh, like if you follow their logic, well, if the, if the chloride is low, it hasn't been able to help free the radium from the rock, so would it then be stuck in the rock and therefore come up with the drill cuttings, and the drill cuttings are going to be hot? And I asked this to uh, Avner Vengosh, who's one of the lead experts on this, and he said, oh, that's a good question, and we don't know. So there's just, there's so many unknowns, and unfortunately the regulators aren't, you know, I mean, someone should be looking into this immediately, a whole team of people. Um, yeah. So, so we're measuring uh, ozone, the, the, the Colorado Department of Public yeah. Health and Environment is... They also uh, measure particulates. Yeah. Could some of this dust be some of those particulates that they? So that's the yeah, that's such a good question. So um, so radium will um, in the U the uranium two thirty eight decay chain, radium's direct daughter product is, is a form of radon, and radon is another really worrisome radioactive element because it's a gas, and it has a half life that's very short. So if you breathe in a molecule of radon, it's going to decay inside you, which means that um, you know your skin, a piece of paper can block some radiation. But if something's inside of you, your internal organs are nice and soft. They can't block anything. And this is um, the worst way to take in ingestion or inhalation. So ra and radon is a gas, so it's very easy to inhale. Um, and then what happens is radon goes through one, two, three, four really quick decays. So a decay just means a radioactive element is, is losing pieces of itself with massive amounts of energy and then becoming a new element. So each time you go through a decay, you're, you're just blasting radiation into wherever you are. And if you're in someone's lung, you're blasting into the lung. And then you end up with radioactive lead, which will stick around for like 20 years. Um, so if you're in the air, and this is an important point because I want to lead to, I, I want to kind of give a list of places questions to ask where to look in Colorado. Um, but one big issue is, is the radon. And we saw it with that 1982 paper. Obviously, the industry was worried about it. They said the public has risk. So why is the public has risk? So well, let's go back to like a frack waste cleaning pond. They have a big pool of produced water. We know it has high radium. It's venting radon. And the regulators, the industry will tell me, oh, well, radon, that's what we want to do. We vent it. It goes up into the atmosphere. And I'm like, no, it becomes radioactive lead. What happens to that? And then when I talk to the nuclear physicists, they're like, oh, well, that will, it can um, join up with particulate matter and fall down as rain, or it can fall down on its own. Um, it can, in various ways, fall back to Earth. But yes, it can, it, it, it can join up with other things in the air, like particulates. I don't know if you have a lot of particulates, are you going to enhance your ability for them to capture radon? I don't know the answer to a question like that, but what my worry is, if you have a lot of ra if you have a lot of radium pooled somewhere, like these cleaning plants um, or a brine tank that's open, you have radon going out. Where are these daughter products falling out? And people will tell me, oh, we don't have to worry; it's not enough. But I'm like, no, 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 no. The air patterns do weird things, and you have so much. So what we're doing now with a couple different groups I'm connected with is looking for lead 210. And this is something, so if I had to devise a study to be done in Colorado, and you all can do it, because unfortunately there's homes um, which you know have access, if you know the person, are so close to well pads, um, you would, I would look downwind from some of these big well pads and also big gas processing facilities where they have huge emission stacks and see if you have radioactive lead, lead 210 accumulating. This is not that difficult. I mean, a researcher who could get funding could look, um, you know, it's just taking a soil sample and then doing a certain type of analysis. Um, and you could ans help answer that question if you knew how much radon was coming up at the wellhead, but that's what has been um, veiled from us. We, there's very few numbers on that, but, but that would be a really important number. But we know that it's a lot because if we go back to um, this paper, um, you know, talks about um, related facilities, pipelines, gasoline plants. So why are those radioactive? So what happens is we do know radon 
will travel with the methane and especially the ethane and propane stream. So as you're going through the, the chain, you have radon in a pipeline. Um, and then radon will decay out and lead to 10 will then form um, a scale on the coating this pipeline. And these scales ha can be quite radioactive. And this is, was another huge revelatory moment um, is that you have on pipelines across the country, it pump at pumps and valves in uh, refineries, in different petrochemical plants, you have these scales building up. And I know they're concerned for workers because another person that um, I've interviewed, and I just um, saw them again this morning actually because they're in this area, um, they worked at a facility that cleaned these valves and pumps. And, um, and they have pictures of holding a Geiger counter up above it, and it's like 25 times the background radiation of, of the room. Um, and, um, and all sorts of complicated things happen with this individual story. But essentially, here's another group of at-risk workers, not even at the oil field. Uh, companies will send them these pumps and valves, seals, and they have to clean them, but there's a radioactive scale that's accumulated. They're doing this in a room without proper ventilation. They're not wearing you know, appropriate equipment, and they can be breathing in dust. And that's actually a really, really bad exposure because, again, you're breathing in, in dust. Like, as you get into radioactivity science, dust is, um, is what you want to stay away from because it can, it can coat your skin, can coat the garden, it can, um, and you can breathe it in. Um, so, yeah, maybe helps answer that question. Um, yes, Jason. Um, have, in your research, have you, have you looked in uh, the background radiation how the, the measurement of background radiation itself is being skewed from what we would think of as just a natural. They're actually including uh, man-made created radiation in the definition of background radiation. Yeah, no, it's a good point. So there's all, it, it, gets, it gets so difficult to explain this because there's so many ways to measure radioactivity. Even the units are, are, can get really complicated. Um, and then you have to convert between units. Some units deal with um, a human, a biological aspect, and some just deal with a count. And then, right, some will take into account background. Um, I don't know if I know specifically, but I know that it's easy to mask a number by measuring in a certain way. And then there's also some ways of measuring that are discounted because they don't, they're not accurate, but people what if you think so, 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 when I thought, think of background radiation, I think right. of, oh, that's just the radiation that's naturally oh, okay. occurring no, in, no, in, right. the, in the world. Well, their definition actually yeah. includes radiation that's coming from man-made, it's not, it's not just organic. So there, you know, I, I think of background radiation was, oh, that's what the radiation was, uh, you know, during caveman days. It's just the background radiation. Uh, but in, in all actuality, the, the background radiation is, is it, it also includes, uh, anyways, that's... Well, well, right. Well, one important thing off of that, and this I will hear all the time from, from industry or regulators, is that, oh, you don't have to worry because it's naturally occurring, <laughs> which is, right. It, oh. Right, yeah, just like arsenic. It's naturally occurring. Um, but this is, um, you know... Right, yeah. It's, I, I, right. I wonder why that's... Um, they got to change that one soon. But no, that is um, the type of response I'll get. Uh, this is, um, I mean, this is important to say. So I was talking to someone before this. What, what again, another black box, what, how, what does radioactivity want to do to people as you inhale it, ingest it, as you breathe these different elements through? Um, we know things because from places, you know, like Hanford, Washington, or Rocky um, Mountain Arsenal, yeah, Rocky Flats, um, places where people, workers often were unintentionally exposed and then populations were tracked, or um, places where people were intentionally exposed and populations were studied. For me, the most um, informative document was this paper. This is an image from a 1931 article in the um, American Journal of Cancer. And it was written by Harrison Martland, who was a medical researcher who looked at the radium girls. The radium girls were these women who were making radio, um, painting clock dials and watch dials using this paint that, was, that had radium in it. it was, and it would cause certain elements in the um, paint to glow. The radium would, it excited them. 
it glowed. What a wonderful way, except the, the, um, the workers would dip the brush and then keep the tip firm by dipping in their mouth. So they got exposure, and these workers started dying of really rare sarcomas, strange cancers, and, um, and Harrison Martlin wrote completely incredible, like an 85-page um, document. At this point, he had done autopsy, autopsies on 29 of the radium girls. So for me, um, this is the best source. What does radium do in the human body? He lays it out. Um, and there's, and even from health officials in states where this is occurring, they'll say, well, we don't know. No, no, we do know. You just have to go back a little before. Another interesting thing, I mean, I, I love some of these earlier papers because I think it's before maybe certain industries had influence over the universities or researchers. So, um, and, 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 and Harrison Martland is regarded as, you know, a, a one of the founders of occupational um, health science when it comes to radioactivity. He's very well respected. Yeah. I just sort of on this note, uh, assuming I, I am not a doctor for, for legal reasons, but is, is there any way of reliably approximating the accumulation of radioactive nucleides in the body? Any so, sort of biochemical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. Okay, that's a great question. There is, and it's awesome you asked it. So first I'll give you a scary thing that Harrison Martland found. Harrison looked at the skeletons of some of these radium girls um, and he calculated in an amazing line in the paper that they had so much radium, and there wasn't even that much. If the amount was not that much, but there's still enough in their bones that in the year 3491, it would still be giving out like 180,000 alpha particles a second. That is just mind-blowing. So if, uh, like, go fast forward into the future. Their graves, the skeleton is still blasting out. So radium is a, it's called a bone seeker. Your body mistakes it as calcium, and about 20% of it, much of it your body will excrete 80%, but still 20% will end up in the bone. And, and that's something that will be talked about quite a bit in the science. And what Harrison Martland lays out is all these different types of rare sarcomas that develop. And they're often bone issues. Um, and and um, even if it doesn't form necessarily a cancer, it can still cause a lot of stress um, at bones. He talks about certain bones, bigger bones being um, more likely for these sarcomas to form, but so can you test it now? If you go to the CDC page on radium, they list um, different tests for radium exposure, and they're really scary. One of them is an exhalation test. This is right now. You can go to the CDC page, just Google CDC radium exhalation test. So they can, radium, because radium-226 decays to radon, radon's a gas, they can measure um, the amount of radon that you're emitting via your breath and use that. I've, tr I've talked to everyone I know, like, please, can someone do this? Help me do this test. Um, you know, it seems if we can do the complicated things like, you know, heart, <laughs> remove hearts and organs, we can do this. But um, I've known no one who, like, knows how to do this test or has been able to get that test done. You can also test the urine. Um, and that's something I want to get to eventually with all the people I'm in touch with, help them get tested. I've finally been led to a company in New Mexico that deals with the nuclear industry, and it seems like they can test, um, you know, workers' urine, and, and we can set something up where we're sending in samples, and they can test it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, it's tricky. It's not that hard, but yet it's impossible because so far, as far as I know, no one's done these tests. Um, and... Um, I mean, but that's where it needs to go. And this is an extraordinary, you know, part of it. It doesn't, it doesn't disappear. So each of us, if you think of the skeleton emanating the alpha particles, we're, we're like our own little, um, you know, data strip. And you can't, you can't, you know, remove someone's bones. I mean, it's there. If you had a bad exposure, especially over the course of time, like this worker who was cleaning the scale off the pipes and breathing in for eight years the dust, the evidence of whether they do or don't have, you know, certain radioactive elements, because not just radium, lead 210 can be a bone seeker also. Um, that, that's there in your bone. So we can find that. Um, and I have run this by, you know, then I take this information. I'll go to like class action lawyers. <laughs> I'll be like, what happens when we do this? And they're like, well, look, class action lawsuits, you know, things get started with public knowledge. So right now, no one has knowledge on this. So there's not going to be much. But if people started to get knowledge, yeah, I could see this thing like picking up steam and going pretty far. Um, and I, to me, it seems 
um, yeah, it, it's absolutely devastating, which I imagine is you know, why we, the industry has hidden it for so long. Yeah. You know, one thing that I think would bring it home a little bit when you talked about, you know, hoping it pick up speed, uh, picks up steam, is if you take a look at the dump site that we were talking about on 14, there's a valley below that, so it's essentially uphill from a lot of folks. Yeah. And then the second thing that I think a lot of folks need to know in this room, particularly those that aren't in Weld County or Windsor, both the Weld County and the town of Windsor are talking about making the oil industry a safe haven. Mm -hmm. So you know if they're not going to be doing this type of stuff, you can almost imagine the impact it's going to have within the entire communities. And a lot of people, they, t they tend to say, well, I don't live in Weld County, well, they can do whatever they want. Well, I, I think that's going to have far reaching. Uh, what, what do you mean by safe haven? I mean, that's like, their terms in... I, like a legal safe haven where they can't... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's on video. That's a quote yeah, from the mayor of Windsor. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, wow. It's on record saying that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. Smart. Well, they've got so many lawyers. But what? So right now in southwestern Pennsylvania, by the way, you have a Ewing sarcoma cancer cluster that's happening. No one is talking about Harrison Martlin yet. Um, hopefully once my story comes out, people will start at least talking. I'm not saying, um, I mean, what's scary is if you look at the sarcomas that Martlin describes and you look at some of the specific bones where the sarcomas are happening, and this is all kids, it's very devastating what's happening there. Um, at this point, dozens of cases, again, really great Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reporters have documented this, um, but no one is necessarily tying it to radioactivity, even though this school, where, which is kind of the epicenter, is right next to an old dump site for a uranium, um, a uranium and radium processing mill. It's, it's, right, it's less than a mile from the school, so it doesn't necessarily have to be from the nuclear, sorry, from the oil and gas industry. So they have that, they have, they have landfills nearby, they have all sorts of development like here, um, and this is starting to hit alarm bells, um, and this is something you know I'm going to be following. Why? Um, no one has answers. The state does not have answers. In the state's report on the cancer cluster, they don't even call it a cancer cluster. They say it's statistically insignificant, um, which is a typical playbook. But you know, I think it's important to bring some of this old science out to say, like, well, no, we do know about it. We do know. And again, the scientists I talk to will say, of course, Harrison Marlin, we we know what radium, we know what happens. Um, we know what, what radon does. I mean, radon is the second leading cause of, of lung cancer deaths in the U.S., right behind smoking, which is a pretty startling fact because we're not, like if you have radon in your home, the count is pretty low. It's like, you know, the, the EPA limit is four. Again, when PICO carries, four PICO carries per liter. And you might have like five or six or maybe 10, and then you have to remediate. Um, so how is radon... Um, you know, killing so many people. Well, I mean, for one, it's just, it's a really bad exposure pathway. I don't know. I don't, and I want to talk to people who did that study. I don't know why radon, even before we get to the oil and gas world, um, is, you know, um, so, so deadly. But it, but it is. It's really worrisome. And again, when I was saying we don't have data, we have a little bit of data. So uh, one study from Pennsylvania talks about the radon in the gas stream at like 127 picocuries per liter, which is, you know, again, EPA limit is four. That's high, but it's at the gas well. How much of it decays out over the, over the pipeline um, a, a, and how much is, you know, moving down the line? These are unanswered questions. But I've seen data from other countries, an amazing report from Saudi Arabia that talks about um, radon concentrations in the propane stream in the tens of thousands of pico carries, which is, um, I was really surprised by that. So, um, but again, more, so if I had to ask, you know, a study to do in Denver, I want to know how much radon is in the product stream coming up at wellheads. You can do that test. That is not a hard test. And I'm going to tell you why you can do that test. The first paper on oil and gas radioactivity this is 1904. 1904, this is in um, Petrolia, Ontario, um, which is an oil and gas producing region in southern Ontario. And uh, they went to a farmer's field. Um, I've been there. You know, it looks kind of like here, but no Rocky Mountains in the background. And, um, and they measured a radioactive gas. That radioactive gas was radon. So this is not, we did this study 115 years ago. And in, this, and in the course of this document, they talk about, um, I forget the exact language, it's in my story, but it's, um, um, you know, like a worrisomely high level. I mean, they noted that, wow, there's a lot of radon in this product. 
Um, so that's what needs to be done. Just please, just replicate a 115-year-old study and find out how much radon. And then also, yeah, let's look for the daughter products, the heavier things like lead-210 downwind of um, gas processing plants, of wellheads, and see if that's accumulating, and also of landfills. Um, those are two things that I would you know, want to see data on. Yeah. So when we burn stuff in our gas tanks, are we so emitting radon? No, so great question. It would have it would have played it out on one of the many, many pumps and valves that it hit before. So radon has a half-life of like 3.8 days. Um, so if you the general um, range is that if you wait like 10 radon half-lives, which is like 30 to 40 days, your most of your radon is gone. It's not gone, it's on the pipeline. It's on all the different pieces that took it before the refinery. So at the refinery, yeah, it's that, that paper from the Oil and Gas Journal talks about um, radon daughter products accumulating at the refinery. But after the refinery, no. You're not gonna know, um, have, um, the radon is plated out, but where you would have a question of concern is, um, is natural gas, if you're burning natural gas. Yeah. So it's in natural gas. But again, well, yeah, it follows ethane stream, mm -hmm. methane stream, and the propane stream. So we're yeah. burning it. I, we, d we, I know from looking at the science and bouncing this off scientists, like, oh yeah, we should be testing. But again, no, this is these are studies that have astonishingly, because so many communities, even New York City now, is on frac gas. So here's a little. This is how concerned a really cool group in New York called Sane Energy was. New York City was getting its gas for the longest time from the Gulf Coast. Long stretch of pipelines. So by the time the gas got up there, it, it was more than 30 days. The radon had played it out uh, and there wasn't a concern. But suddenly, like 2010, all this talk of building pipelines from the Marcellus, and now New York City is like very close to, and, and very close to its gas source and next to a gas source that we know is a really high radioactive signature. So a couple people in this group, Sane Energy, you know, knew about the radioactivity from really good geologists in New York. They alerted, the, alerted their local legislators. All they wanted to do was have the utility, Con Ed, test at the point where the gas comes into the city. Just test, do a radon test. And they put a bill forth, and it, you know, it was completely obliterated. It didn't go forward and that test has never been done. And I don't know of any community that's done this test, but again, this, like, where do you want to start testing? I mean, that test is, um, I would start there in a lot of different places. So using local gas or whatever. If, you're using, if you're using gas that's really close, so it hasn't had a lot of transfer time, and also to a play where there's a high radioactive signature, then yeah, I would be really, Concern in, the, but again, the numbers that I've seen in the Denver Julesburg, I mean, I haven't seen numbers, but just trying to estimate them from these chloride numbers, you would think, oh, well, there's not a lot of radium. Maybe there's not a lot of radon, but that's, you know, not something to put your life on. I mean, I would want to know. It's just test the radon, test the radon at the wellhead. What are the numbers? And then we can answer all these questions in a much more authoritative way. Yeah. Well, I know that nitrates uh, fertilizer uh, messes up the Gulf Coast when the rivers go down and right. stuff. But how much of a contribution do you think that uh, of the radiation is to that dead zone? That's yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there were. It's going to stay from the papers I've read. Radium, if it's spewed out into a river, it's going to settle out pretty quickly. And there's a really interesting paper from Louisiana where they found radium was accumulating in oysters. Um, just down from um, discharge valves. This was before um, pits. They were just taking the produced water, piping it right into the bayou, and people like, who knew the science were like, oh, wow, oysters are filter feeders. We should look in the oysters. And they found radium there. Um, and, and a lot of Louisiana puts forth some good laws in part in reaction. I mean, oystering is a big industry there. So it's not, the concern would not be way downstream. It would be like if you have a, a in, in Pennsylvania, a paper came out recently that found radium in freshwater mussels in a small creek where there's a discharge. So things that are close um, and in bodies of water that are, you know, small. A, in a way, a dilution um, by, you know, with a big river um, w will help, you know, 
settle it out because Pico carries per liter of radium. Once you get into like a massively flowing river, um, it will kind of like get lost in the mix. But right close, there's a really big concern. So if you have like a creek that has a lot of things, you know, sites that are discharging, um, that would be a big worry. And then, yeah, if you have it accumulating in mussels or oysters, well, then you're like um, going down the food chain. And again, another place, okay, well, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> There's radium in mussels in Pennsylvania. What's eat, what eats the mussels? The raccoons, um, the fish. So there's a scientist right now at Penn State University because his work found radium in the shells of the mussels. Um, so is it in the meat? Is it in the part that an animal will eat? And he's doing that study right now to figure out. So a lot of this research, I mean, and that, that is a great question. I'm so happy when I find scientists like that because it's like, okay, you're on it. I can at least, you know, wait for a check on that one. So the shells um, are kind of like bones. Yeah, it seems like it, right. But he's curious, um, that research team is curious, so now they're looking in, you know, the soft tissue part. Um, yeah, and I, th I think some animals probably eat the whole muscle. But, um, Okay, yeah, that, um, no, that's, um, you know, one thing I want to leave you all with, because it's so, an amazing part of doing this has been to meet people like you all across the country, and the people in Appalachia, in Ohio, in West Virginia, in Pennsylvania, um, so strong, I mean, like you all, so interesting, up against so much, so much. And the same stories about, you know, well, how did these things get in place? And, you know, how did it all get started? And who slid what under the table? They have their version of that. Um, and they, though, are connected back to you because the big player in that area, one of the big players is Antero, um, which is right here in downtown Denver. So I don't know if Antero is in the DJ, but they're in the Marcellus in a major, major way. So if anyone after this, you know, is interested forming a connection. I'm really close to that um, community, to the people in Appalachia who are fighting on fracking issues. And I just think that would be such a powerful connection because you all have a lot in common. Yeah. I want to ask when your article comes out. The article's out in the December issue. We're almost there. Okay. Yeah. I filed the first draft in October. I thought like, oh, I've got it. So it's been like 14 months of edits. But they've done a really good job on it. It's really, um, yeah. I think it's going to be shocking. Um, yeah. Is the radioactivity why it was such a good de-icer? So again, the science behind, so this is like, it's another wool over the eyes. Now, um, it's, it, there's a lot of salt. There's huge amounts of salt in produced water, really. Um, and, and it's under that um, you know, idea, I think, that they thought, oh, this, it has a lot of salt. You know, we put salts on the road. It can be a good de-icer. Um, but, there's also a lot of toxic heavy metals that, you know, will, s and, and there's radium. So, um, and also brine produced water is not a very consistent uh, mix. It can be very different from well to well. Signatures can change, concentrations can change. So, it, you know, if you're doing something commercially, you want it to be uniform, and brine certainly isn't. Um, so, what it really is, is a cheap way for the industry to get rid of its waste. And again, like the, the logic of it is really absurd. If you have a spill of brine at a wellhead, that has to be, you know, uh, in every state I know, I think, you know, you have to file, um, you know, call up your regular regulator, say, you know, we spilled this much brine, um, it happened here, file a little report. But yet, you can put it in a truck and spread it on roads without, that's, that's legal. Um, all across the Northeast, and in a lot of the upper Midwest. They're doing it here. Okay, and so yeah, I've seen Colorado is a state that allows it, but I'm not aware of how much happens. But um, they said it was a test study. I think for the last two years, I believe they said they were testing it. <laughs> yeah, parts of the major highways is what it was. Right, and I haven't heard it since then. Okay. It works great. So this is something. <laughs> that is great. Very, uh, right. Um, the, the Greeley Airport used it at one point. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. about it. Yeah. For the runway, to keep the ice all on. Yeah. I bet it does. Mm -hmm. That's a good issue to stay on because, um, and I've heard from, from people, from drivers, because in Pennsylvania, because people have fought, they've actually temporarily stopped brine spreading. And it's really, again, it's one amazing woman who unfortunately is quite sick, but she, with help of others, but really single-handedly, like, 
stopped this whole train. The drivers are furious at her because they, you know, they had this job which, um, you know, had a decent income. But they tell me that the com the conventional oil and gas industry, which produces brine also, if it can't get rid of its waste for free, they have a really tough time even staying afloat. Then they have to pay to take it to a treatment plant or somewhere else, and it's it's like the cost calculus is completely shot. Um, and to focus on that just for one more moment, this is a good place to end it. So I, I've asked, this is a big, you know, one paragraph in the story. What happens to the industry if they lose the exemption? Um, and one really great researcher, or a, a law professor in Ohio, has written like, I think 53 textbooks, which that's like, I, as a journalist, you got like one adjective to describe someone. Or one, but like, um, how, that's just so impressive. He's written 53 law-related textbooks, a lot of them on energy development, on land use. So he, and he was recommended by many people. So I finally take this question to him. Um, what happens if the <laughs> industry lost the exemption? And just one word, he said disaster. Um, other people have told me, no, that it would settle out and the good players would be able to survive and it would weed the industry out. Um, but and there is one report that I've seen where they did a cost calculation and it ends up being like a hundredfold. Like the cost of taking waste to your local landfill is, you know, maybe $6 a ton. I don't remember exactly, but let's say it's that. Um, the cost of shipping it to like a site out west in Utah where I'm going to go tomorrow where, you know, is strictly designated for radioactive waste would end up being like $6,000. Um, so it's just that cost alone is, is just blows it um, completely out of the sky. What is the name of the guy? Which guy? The, the, the oh, um, my Marvin Resnikoff. Yeah. And if you look up Marvin Resnikoff, uh, last name R-E-S-N-I-K-O-F-F, -F, the first thing you'll see, you all have probably been targets of this, the industry is good at this, is you'll see industry stories saying that he's crazy, that he's wackadoodle, but uh, he's a, I mean, he's been around since the nuclear industry. He started his work, you know, in the Chernobyl area, with, which, uh, era, which a lot of these people did. Um, he's, you know, well-respected, um, and he did these cost calculations um, and has been a source on other things, too. Um, yeah, I'm going to, after the article, what I want to do is produce something I'm calling a radioactive cookbook, <laughs> which will, <laughs> well, because there's so many, it's like so many questions come up. Like if you're, you know, a lot of people are fighting pipelines and they have a lot of good questions, but no one is saying, well, who's going to clean out this radioactive scale? Well, now I know the answer. There's a group of people, it's called pigging work. And this is another worker exposure. So like, I think these types of questions need to be asked. Um, you know, and I get it, of course, that, you know, reasons for this industry, but they are, all these extern externalities are, you know, they're getting away. They're all of them right now. So at least educate people so they can ask the regulators, yeah, what are you going to do with the radioactive scale, by the way? And most of them will probably be like, what? But then I'm going to give you a document which, you know, cites it. Um, so that's, that should be coming. I'll get addresses from Karen and send you a huge <laughs> package of radioactive cookbooks. <laughs> Um, no blow it dust mitigation. They, I have heard that they use it for dust mitigation on dirt roads. Yeah, so that's actually the more common way. In Pennsylvania, it's even more common to use for dust mitigation in the summer. And that, we, I've, there's now two different papers I have. The science on that is, is no, it makes it dustier. There's no science behind using it on dust mitigation. Absolutely no. It makes it dustier. And yeah, and that is just really worrisome. A, you know, crops growing right next to these roads, uh, the radium dust settling out on the crops. On dirt roads? On dirt roads. Wow. Has, has anyone tested, Wendell, as far as you know, do you, have you ever seen tests from the DJ for radium um, in produced water? Well, they, they test, but they use the EPA's 900 series, which is scientifically discredited. Discre okay. Okay. And, do you, and, and where the numbers? Well, we the land spreads are controlled by the uh, COGC. Okay. And the uh, waste dumps are controlled by the CDPHE, the health department. Okay. And uh, the uh, the testing that's done by the COGC is essentially 
What is this? Okay, okay. So we are still awaiting good tests. Um, and you know, something to do, like if you have local researchers, just lead them to the work of people like, um, I'll write a couple names down, and I know we're um, ending, so I'll just write like some good scientists for homework reading, um, because these scientists have started cracking into this back east. Scientists in this area could start, you know, be inspired by their work and take it in their own direction, but, um, um, you know, d uh, Dr. Avner Vengash at Duke has yeah. um, done a lot of great work on this. Um, that's Duke, the Penn State team, is, um, um, and there's others at Penn State, but Dr. Bill Burgos did a really great paper on Brian. He's a co-author, so when I say he, many other interesting people on this team, this is just the person I ended up connecting with, um, did a paper on brine um, and road spreading. Um, the person looking at the oysters is um, Matt Warner. Um, if you want, um, a really great resource. Um, Melissa Troutman of Earthworks did a really amazing report on oil and gas waste, and it go and it talks in detail about the absurdity of the exemption. Um, it's called Wasting Away. That's a great resource. Um, and um, and any questions? Um, I'll give you my email too. You know, just ask, because there's a lot I know, and I couldn't get to it all. But if you have something specific, you know, I can um, lead you in that direction. I mean, that's something I feel obligated to do, is like help throw the information on, um, because it's useless just. I wanted um, to add there a, 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 yeah. a person from the University of Iowa, William Schultz. Yeah. So and he's the one that uh, shows that the regulatory right. agencies Method of testing is worthless. Okay, right. And so, the, right, yeah, there's this specific. So, we, we, if we have a question about radioactivity, we call in the state agency. Right. They whitewash it, and that's it. Right, right. This it's called the EPA 900 series. Right, a way of testing. It's essentially a way to test relatively clean, um, not as gunked up streams right. of water. Right. It's, it's designed for uh, water, not brine. Okay, right, and brine is such a, yeah, such a, brine is such a complicated um, material mixture that not only is it gunking up all these treatment plants, it's, you can't use that form of testing, but yet it often is used. So that's another, um, it is a big issue. Um, you know, are you even getting an accurate reading if you're getting a reading? Um, but the good universities and the good, like um, the team at Iowa, you know, they know um, even the DOE knows um, you have to that. Use, yeah, you have to use a, a spectrometer. Right. You can't use a Geiger <laughs> And that's what Which they do. That's what they use here. That's what they <laughs> use here. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, ways to make it disappear. Um, so, yeah, that, I'm just going to put the email up there. Just mm -hmm. easy, justinnoble at gmail.com. That's so easy. And um, yeah, and check out the December issue because um, it's going to um, hopefully start a major fire on this. Noble, noble yeah. justice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening.